Hello once again, ladies and gentlemen. Can we talk about Transformers? Ah, uh, yes. Hello. This is the Can We Talk About podcast, a podcast which uh, you probably know what the deal is at this point. You yeah. know, we got the A, you got the A's cartoons, got nostalgia for things that existed when we didn't. Mm. I'll make references to song lyrics because I can't help myself. I'll yell at you for it. But. All as we go through a series of Might and Metal, actual 80s cartoon classic, The Transformers, I can snap a jet plane over my knee! I am Joe. Don't you recognize me? I'm Kristen. And we are watching The Transformers Generation 1 via Tubi, which is a free streaming platform with intermittent commercials. Tubi has the broadcast order of Season 2 of Transformers, so if you want to watch along, you got to make sure you're checking the Transformers wiki, which has it in production order for some reason. Whatever. And Kristen, have you been watching anything fun over the various streaming platforms that, you know, we all got 85 subscriptions to? <laughs> I watched all of the documentary The Devil Next Door, and that was pretty wild. I can't remember if I watched that one. It was about a man in, in Ohio who was accused of being a gas chamber operator during the Holocaust. He was a Ukrainian immigrant. Oh! And they went through a whole like seven year trial with people saying, yes, he is definitely this man and him being like, you have the wrong person. And both sides of um, the defense and prosecution getting new evidence every once in a while that the other swore was fake, seeming to definitively prove the case one way or the other. What the fuck? It was a roller coaster. It was six six episodes, I think, so it's not super long or anything. It was crazy. I'm glad I finally watched it. Oh my god, no, I was thinking of the other one about the dude that was kidnapping, like, a neighbor little girl and pretended to be an alien to have sex with her. Ooh, that is... Uh, kidnapped in plain sight. There we go. Which was one of my favorite things I watched last year. <laughs> That, that is definitely the most, I keep yelling out loud, what, 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 as I am watching um, of true crime documentaries. What I watched, Kristen, was I decided, hey, I have Disney+, Plus and I'm not really making much use of it. Let me, let me fill the gaps in my not having watched a lot of Pixar movies recently. And I started with uh, A Bug's Life, which of course is not recent, because I had never seen A Bug's Life. I was going to say, oh, I've heard Coco is good. Have you gotten to that? I did, and I, I cried, I'm going to say, three times in the last half hour. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Coco is a movie, Kristen, that I specifically was like, I know I'm going to cry if I watch this, mm -hmm. so I'm not going to watch this. Mm -hmm. And I held it off for a good four to six months, because it was on Netflix, like, the entire time. Oh, yeah, that's right. And finally, I was just like, you know what, fuck it, I'm just going to do it. And I'm glad I did, but fuck. I haven't seen Coco, I just know it's about death. It's good, though, you should watch it. I know. I think the last Disney movie I even watched was Moana. This week, Kristen, is an episode of what I might call Wasted Potential. I agree with that. Of all the episodes we've watched so far, this definitely feels like the most Saturday morning cartoon villainish in that Megatron has all these cool things he could do, but uses them in the most bare bones, boringest way possible when he could very easily just win. Almost maybe feels like this is the sort of plot line that could be used in nearly any cartoon. <laughs> We'll get into it. It is Attack of the Autobots, Kristen, and the Autobots are about to attack! Attack of the Autobots, written by David Wise, who gave us such gem classics, Kristen, as Culture Clash and mm. Renaissance Woman. Yeah. And before we uh, got on podcast here, we're going to give this about a, a half a point as a David Wise episode. So he is currently, <laughs> currently batting 500, 50-50 here. <laughs> I mean, we, I don't know. I really don't like Culture Clash. We've talked no. about that extensively at this point. Garbage. Um, Renaissance Woman is not good, but it is great. <laughs> yes. I mean, there aren't <laughs> many cartoons that are going to have literal Cask of Amontilladoing uh, Iron Sex Mask shit. Yeah, it's fun. Also, I think all the songs in that were good. I don't know how much David Wise had to do with that, but that helped it as a gem episode for sure. So yeah, go back and listen to those. Yeah, go back. <laughs> Stop listening to this new thing and go listen to the old thing. Listen to our opinions of David Wise episodes evolving 
over several years. We start Kristen outside the arc here. We got Optimus, we got Blue Streak, and we got Ratchet who are working on some guff when Teletran just decides. Teletran basically just goes, ah! Teletran's screensaver comes up is what I said. Like a big glowy Autobot logo comes on and that lets Optimus <laughs> know, oh shit, I should probably check to see if Teletran has a report. Uh, Joe, I am not okay with Teletran being so chatty this episode. Having a personality, it feels like. Yeah, all of a sudden. I feel like its voice is different. I just am not really a fan. Well, Casey Kasem is Teletran 1, and I don't know if I've been paying attention enough to point that out on previous occasions, but moving forward, I believe Casey Kasem should be Teletran 1 every time. Okay. I didn't notice. A lot of Casey Kasem in this episode, given that there's also a lot of blue streak action. Yeah, didn't notice at all. It took me about half the episode to even realize this guy that I was looking at was not Ratchet. So Teletran reports that there is Decepticon activity here, and two seconds into the episode, it is time to transform and roll out. So they are uh, doing their usual shitlord. Decepticon activity could mean that they're just outside, like, playing volleyball or something. It could very well be. Uh, we find that uh, Teletran in this episode, Kristen, can tell the difference between good and evil. He goes beyond good and evil, I guess. <laughs> That seems, like, subjective. (laughs) Rumble and Laserbeak are commanded to distract the Autobots here while the Jets seem to be doing a lot of distracting already because they're flying around, you know, shooting lasers and stuff. There's lots of jet action in this episode. Zero jet dialogue. Very weird that because this is Attack of the Autobots, I don't think even Soundwave has any lines, even though he shows up standing next to Megatron for most of the episode. Megatron and Rumble might be the only ones with lines. (laughs) Which, nice. So Prowl gets smacked around by Laserbeak here, and Mm. Prowl is like, you know what, fuck it. I'm going to really fuck up this Metal Bird cassette. So he takes about 15 seconds to load like a a clacker thing, a bolo. I love to reload in the middle of battle. (laughs) Basically, he fires a grappling hook at Laserbeak's leg and tries to... Apparently, Laserbeak is so fucking strong because Prowl cannot get control of him either. <laughs> I really thought this was going to be like another net or something because we know Laserbeak does not deal well with nets. Optimus mentions that he has a warning diode that is pulsing at one point here. Whatever you say, dude. And sure enough, there are some jets on the horizon here. Optimus jumps to knock Ratchet out of the way from an oncoming missile. But Kristen, <gasps> there's still Rumble to worry about. Wow. Oh, um, Optimus being a big drama queen as usual because they had plenty of time to just walk out of the way of the missile <laughs> and he insists on doing a big cackle, which I think leads to Rumble being like, hey, idiots, bonk, 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 and them falling into a earth split as per usual. The ground opens up and they just fall right in. Mm-hmm. Apparently they float. They hover for a while in there. Oh, uh, we'll get there, I guess. Yeah, because... we'll get back to that. They, you, we say we, they fall. Do they? Who knows? Megatron looks incredibly doofy in this next shot I wrote, Kristen. Some people look a little off-model in the beginning area here. There is a super good worm-eye view of a bunch of the Autobots later, and their heads are so small. Megatron looks like he doesn't have a neck in this shot, basically. It looks like his head is... he looks like Strong Matt almost. (laughs) Nice. So we don't know really what's going on here, but we do see Starscream start to, like, wet t-shirt contest Megatron. (laughs) And then he is an outline. Yeah, we see a what I wrote as a wireframe for the benefit of the viewers at home because uh, Megatron, uh, somebody did. Maybe it was Starscream because he's the air quote scientist. But yeah, uh, somebody on the Decepticons developed invisibility spray. So I know this is pedantic. Yes. Which is my new favorite word ever since we started doing Transformers. It seems like, you know, Mirage is a thing. Yes. And how he can just like turn invisible like electrically or something um needing to make an invisibility spray seems fucking crazy (laughs) (laughs) it's like spray paint kristen it's the uh roswell that ends well it's the clothes in a can i guess there we go except opposite (laughs) except invisible (laughs) yeah it's fine so Starscream is sprayed as well as Megatron and Starscream head into the Ark, which they were apparently standing two feet outside of by the way (laughs) good thing they're invisible or someone might have seen them (laughs) Good thing they're invisible and that Teletrain can't detect their evil presence like he does for the Autobots later. They're invisible. So they head into the arc here, Kristen, to fuck up the Autobot recharging chambers because apparently the invisibility spray only lasts about 45 seconds. I don't recall hearing anything about these recharging chambers until now. Well, funny you should mention that, Kristen. Oh no. I don't believe they've been mentioned before this very moment. And Joe, this is going to be another problem later. 
I feel like I should mention it now anyway, so Skyfire is in this episode. Yes, he is. That's true. And he's got one whole line. And he is way too big to fit into that recharging <laughs> pod thing. And at first, I thought it was going to be like, well, obviously, Skyfire is still good. Because there's no way he can fucking fit in there. <laughs> Considering it looks, they look about as big as Optimus is. Yes. That means that Skyfire and the Dinobots are completely no way they could fit in there maybe they no. may, maybe skyfire has a usb jack that he just puts in there and gets almost the same effect i feel like it's everyone left to go um dunk on those jets or whatever and then skyfire like walks out like hey where'd everyone go well okay i'll just and the dinobots just were asleep they didn't give a shit megatron slam dunks a personality destabilizer into <laughs> and this was inside of starscream's <laughs> chest <laughs> just hanging out whatever seemingly not operating in any capacity to do anything no Kristen, it was destabilizing his personality because he didn't say anything all episode uh, do you think that was just his piss poor attitude he took out of his chest that's the destabilizer <laughs> megatron was really mad that he had to put it into this autobot bed because starscream was finally quiet and compliant for once see it seems like for him a win-win for me, my boy didn't talk. They run out of the arc here because, yes, they only have about 10 seconds to just fuck up these things that are very, very early into the arc. They could have done so much more, but they didn't. <laughs> what they're doing is just saying, um, and we don't have time to stick around and do other things. So this was the plan. We have executed the plan. We are out of here. And when the Autobots recharge themselves tomorrow, they'll have a transformation they weren't expecting. Pwah, 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 pwah. We cut back to Rumble here, who is a doofus still. <laughs> yep. He is looking down into the crevasse here like, Labrador, where they go? I believe he basically says, they've been falling for a while. I haven't heard them hit the bottom. How big of a hole did I make? So with no real explanation, in the next shot, we see Optimus and Ratchet about 95% out of the crevice here as they go to tackle Rumble and call him a turkeytron as well. See that he's a brethren. Of Laserbeak, the OG turkey. I was going to say, why did Prowl not call Laserbeak Turkey Tron? Or, okay, is it when they say it to Laserbeak, they mean like a bird. And yes. when they say it to Rumble, oh. they mean like Roxy. <laughs> they're, they're jive talking. Yeah. Is that it? I think that must be it. Boy, I can't wait until Optimus and Ratchet call Rumble a bean bowl. Yep, it's going to be so good. Megatron calls the retreat here, and this allows Laserbeak to escape as, like, we see Laserbeak Prowlist- just turns around and, like, pew, <laughs> like, precision hits the tether that he is on and just flies off, like, whatever, I didn't care anyway. Uh, making it seem like he could have done that at any point. It could have, mm -hmm. I mean, he was there to cause a distraction. Maybe that was the distraction. To be a really unwieldy kite for a while. <laughs> this leaves the Autobots confused here because, I mean, what were the Decepticons really after? They came in- and okay. two of their... <laughs> yes. I, I, I understand the logic that we're getting here. They're like, the Decepticons came, they didn't seem to do anything, and then Megatron's like, we outie. It would be a, like, hmm. Now that is strange. If it wasn't what they always fucking do every single time. <laughs> but, I mean, they have an inkling of the plan. This time it just seems like the Decepticons came in, they caused a little chaos, and they're like, nah, that's enough, and then they leave. <laughs> So, logically, Optimus is like, they probably did something. They don't look to see what that might be. They don't bother checking. Again, Teletran probably could have told them that there was something fucked up. Yeah, doesn't Teletran have, like, a webcam and eyeballs, theoretically? Well, Krista, we see the footage later that Teletran plays for, like, Bumblebee and Jazz, where we see, like, the wireframe version of Megatron, so he wasn't even completely invisible either. Man, now Teletran's just in for it for the drama, too. Ba -na -na -na. So Optimus and Ratchet are seen getting out of the energy recharger thingy, and Optimus is like, all right, everybody. Apparently they went last. <laughs> oh, wait, no, they went first? No, they went first because Optimus <laughs> goes, all right, everybody, into the recharger. Everybody, cr we could fit at least three minibots in there. Get in there. I was really hoping to see a bunch of the minibots go into one at once, um, but we don't get to see that, unfortunately. <laughs> they got a big day here, which they don't really... Okay, so the rest of the episode is about the launching of a satellite. We got a big day trying to figure out... <laughs> what the Decepticons did yesterday. The Autobots were not tasked with protecting this satellite launch. Nope. Even though, even though the satellite can provide infinite energy for Earth forever. 
Yes. They don't really talk too much about that later when we meet um, Chip Chase's mom. <laughs> mom Chase. Mom Chase. We get the second transition here after that two second scene. Teletran gives an alert, which is actually just a news update about the said satellite here, the rocket launch. And <laughs> they're at least like, okay, the Decepticons are definitely going to go get that shit. Yes. Optimus is right on top of this. Just like, okay, we as Autobots here, we need to protect. We need to guard. We need to defend as his eyes start getting red here. And I thought that there was going to be a thing where he would be like, destroy, but he doesn't. That doesn't no. happen. Um, he just kind of, everyone starts to be like, you know what? I'm following your train of thought. And we get a weird thing. It's okay. <laughs> yes. Teletran senses that they're evil suddenly. There is an evil presence that Teletran detects in here, which once again, could have detected to Megatron. Maybe, you know, Kristen, Megatron's not evil. He just really believes in his cause. Uh-huh. He's a good guy, really. Um, there we go. That's what we call lawful evil or chaotic neutral, potentially. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so we do a cut back still shot to the recharging things. And Megatron's just talking. And I don't understand what the fuck is happening here. <laughs> I don't know what happened here, yes. So Megatron starts talking either directly to Teletran somehow, or his voice is coming out of the personality destabilizer within the recharging beds here. And he and explains what's going on. <laughs> he tells the entire plan to Teletran. I mean, he's really telling it to the children. <laughs> And Teletran, speaking for the children here, goes, Megatron, your plan will never succeed. I suddenly have opinions of my own. Shut the fuck up, Teletran. This isn't your battle. We, we had two very different issues with that. Megatron then orders the Autobots to fuck up Teletran, and Optimus smashes his fist through a panel as Teletran begs for his life, basically. Uh, I don't care about this computer. At least when I look at people like Wheeljack, he's Italian, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> computer is just a computer that talks. Megatron laughs as he says the Autobots will cause more panic than the world has ever seen as we get another transition here. Kristen, luckily during all of this, for some reason they weren't at the base recharging. Jazz and Bumblebee are just hanging out with the Witwicky family, just going to a father-son badminton game, I guess. Uh, apparently they were doing a little bit of work that would later inspire Exhibit and... <laughs> Just upgrading Jazz's sound system. That's what they were doing that day. Apparently, they didn't charge themselves before they left in the morning. So, Kristen, I thought when we see Jazz uh, use his brand new sound systems here, which are basically just uh, radar dishes, essentially, that's that somehow produce sound. They're radar dishes that scream. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that somehow the frequency of whatever music Jazz played would turn the Autobots back to normal, but that is not the case. I was wondering something about that, too. So here's something we haven't mentioned at all yet. Weirdly jazz-heavy episode. I, I'm glad that we're getting a jazz episode. Because... Yeah, I'm pretty cool with that. And, like, you know, for as much as I don't give a shit about him, Blue Streak's in this episode a lot, too, so at least we're getting different people doing things, even if they have no discernible personalities of their own, except Jazz, whose personality is... <laughs> Is Bill Bill? Yeah, yeah, baby. And Bumblebee's there too, of course, but you know, he just does <laughs> Bumblebee things. He's just there to um be the kick the dog. Jazz decides to stop, like hard stop in front of like a fucking plateau. And Yeah, they pan <laughs> up this background as if being like, Yes, he's picking it for this reason. It's a big cliff. <laughs> That he's going to go up there, but no, for some reason, Jazz chooses this exact area to be like, I'm going to blow my sound horns directly at the rocks. Uh, for some reason! His goal is to see if he can create a sound avalanche, and he does. Wow, good for him. Bumblebee has the right idea where he's just like, yeah, I don't want my eardrums to burst, so I'm going to leave. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I now cannot stop thinking about edits of this with actual songs playing and what songs those would be. For some reason, my brain was like old-time rock and roll. Really? Okay, my first <laughs> thought... <laughs> my first thought was the Doug classic uh, Shout Your Lungs Out by The Beats. <laughs> That's also a good one. If I think of any others, I'll let you know. <laughs> Sparkplug and Spike are standing in... <laughs> the best in... of you, <laughs> fighters. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Sorry. So Spike and Sparkplug are standing directly in front of Jazz when he decides to start- How did their uh, eyeballs not pop? 
I wrote that jazz immediately burst the eardrums of the humans here as they don't even bother like walking out of the way of the sounds that are clearly pointed forward. Like they don't walk behind jazz or anything. They just stand there and take it as jazz is like playing loud ass rock and roll, playing old time rock and roll really loud. (laughs) So I can kind of imagine um, Spike is a young and him being like, yeah, my ears are t- fresh and chill and I can hear so many frequencies because he does say later that he likes the music. It is very loud, <laughs> but he enjoys it. And Sparkplug is just kind of like, you fucking kids. What is this? It's old time rock and roll. Come on. So the sound waves are so loud here, Kristen, that jazz causes a rock slide, a rock avalanche, mm-hmm. the classic Transformers rock avalanche, which... He does not seem terribly perturbed. He doesn't go like, oh, Spike, spark plug, get in. He's just kind of like, eh, cool. And they just get in and they leave. And that's the last we see of that until it becomes the thing that saves the day. At a certain point, Kristen, we cut to Bumblebee uh, going back to the base here. And he notices, oh, Teletrain's kind of fucked up. Uh, Blue Streak, what happened? There's a big fist hole. In Teletran, that's very strange. And Blue Shriek is like, you ask too many questions, Bumblebee. Why don't you get in the pod? And he's so small. Like, Blue Streak can basically just kind of, like, wrap his hands around him, like, burrito him like a unwieldy <laughs> cat. And just be like, okay, you're getting in there. And he starts to try to slam dunk him in. <laughs> There's a lot of picking Bumblebee up like he is a child in this episode. <laughs> he, he's like, oh, we have a bread box. And sometimes it's hard when we have a, like tortillas in there and also bread and maybe like a bagel or something. And I've just got to like shove the bread in to be like. Get in there. So Bumblebee is struggling to fight this as Jazz and company arrive here. And Blue Street Jazz is like, uh, <laughs> this is strange. And his further response of, uh, when Blue Streak fires a laser at him and Jazz is like, hey, you could hurt somebody with that. Watch it. He's just such an easygoing guy, that Jazz. Jazz realizes that something's going on with Blue Streak here, and he decides to throw a shake weight at him. Just That's just hanging out on the floor. Maybe it was part of the guff that I have Optimus no idea. And... <laughs> he, just, he throws a thing at, at Blue Streak that hits him in the stomach, and then Sparkplug's like, ah, oh, you hit him right in the turnoff switch. He'll be out for hours. <laughs> nice job. Um, He's not really out for hours, but it, they're like, he's not a problem anymore. Don't worry about it. And Spike is like, Bumblebee, what the fuck's going on? And Bumblebee's like, Spike, what the fuck is going on? So this happens multiple times in the episode where Bumblebee is, you know, doing his anime outreach to his friends, encouraging <laughs> them to fight the mind control and stuff. Power I really, friendship stuff, yes. Yeah. And earlier I was like, oh, don't you recognize me? Boy, you're not like this. And my brain just began autofilling that after a while with, it's me, Bumblebee. Don't you recognize my teeth? <laughs> These pearly whites. I worked so hard for them. You always told me, Bumblebee, we love your teeth. Please tell me my teeth are pretty. We get a transition here. Sparkplug finishes fixing up Teletran as Teletran <laughs> spills the beans. <laughs> Teletran's like, ah, you won't believe what happened. <laughs> Kristen, imagine if Megatron didn't tell Teletran what was going on. Teletran would wake up and be like, I have no idea what the fuck is going on. Bumblebee sums it up as succinctly as this. Megatron turned Blue Streak from good to bad. They really simplify this. I didn't think they needed to, but... <laughs> For the kids. I mean, I don't, I don't understand what made this so different from just... The Autobots listen to Megatron now. Segment one ends here with another succinct line as Jazz asks Teletran, how many Autobots have been turned evil by this thing, Teletran? And Teletran answers with a very panicked, all of them! And Kristen, we will get into it. When Teletran says all of them, there are a lot of omissions in this episode that we do not see. Yeah, whatever. Segment two starts at the rocket base here, a very similar, I, I'm sorry, I wrote rocket base. This is actually just a military base, but it looks a lot <laughs> like the one from Autobot Spike, which was a rocket base. Yeah, so the Autobots are going at a clip towards these um, pathetic dividers that don't seem to work <laughs> in any capacity anymore. And uh, an army man is like, oh, stop. And one of the other ones is like, watch out, no one's driving those. As if they don't know what that means at this point. And the Autobots, once they break through, they all calmly transform and start walking over to some jets and start fucking them up. So is this like a weird pent-up piece of aggression that just Megatron has that's coming out <laughs> where he sees a jet and he's like, stress on your dick! It is, it is not explained why the Autobots are fucking up the jets until later. So I did think at the beginning, oh, <laughs> Megatron's <laughs> Meg- Megatron just training, the, training the Autobots to murder Starscream. <laughs> yeah, see, that would be fun. We get a transition. Spike and company are wondering how to counteract what the hell is going on here, but Teletran interrupts them with the attack on the military base. 
Bumblebee springs into action, and Jazz, rightfully, is like, why are you going to try to fight our friends when we don't have a way to reverse, when we don't have a way to switch their switch back from evil to good? Bumblebee, you're small. Fuck that. Let's burn some rubber. And Spike just is like, me too. And they drive away. And Sparkler's like, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> so we get another transition here. Too many transitions. Not as many in this episode as last episode. I think. I know, we but hit... it's still too many. <laughs> I know. I in, in this short succession, it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. But Should they keep just cutting back between very short things happening that are just continuations of things that were happening before. Whatever. <laughs> Ratchet and Hound were ordered to take the plans of the satellite from some futuristic-looking building in the city. In Salt Lake City, I guess. Okay, maybe I'm fucking crazy. I feel like when they talk about the satellite, we see... Maybe I'm making assumptions here. It looked peninsula-like to me. (laughs) And it would make sense that a rocket is shot from as close to the equator as possible. I figured they were in Florida. I'm not going to ask how the fuck they got all the way over to Florida, Kristen. Do, like, do we need to at this point? I, I understand. This it is why happened. it's. This is why it's just a city. All the world's industry can't be in Utah. Some lady is having a, a Bob. <laughs> Chip's mom, as you mentioned previously, is having a Bob Newhart phone call here. Which, Kristen, if you remember TV tropes, is just basically a convenient way to deliver exposition. Mm-hmm. Answer your own questions. Talk to yourself a lot. My rocket. You'll be firing it then. That's wonderful. The Earth really needs this, <laughs> etc. Man, I wonder if we ever hear anything from this genius lady again. She is Dr. Harding, according to her alarm, which also identifies Kristen. (laughs) It says, enemy Autobots have entered the building. And Florida apparently really hates Autobots, I guess, Kristen. (laughs) This is when, every once in a while, it occurs to me that in the cartoon, they don't really ever use the word Transformers, do they? No, I think it's just Autobots and Decepticons, really. Yeah, so that's a weird sort of detail to leave out, but whatever. Hasbro's probably pedantic where they don't want to be like, oh no, evil robots have entered the base. It's got to be just like, no, 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 they're Autobots. Yeah, Enemy Autobots. Transformers is the whole series. Duh. Even though Robots in Disguise is part of the title, mm -mm. no, no. (laughs) Before um, I forget to mention it, by the way, when I heard a woman's voice, I got really disoriented. <laughs> I was going to say, this is the first main, I, I want to say main, she's, a, I guess, a secondary character of the episode, but she's a, a prominent woman that has over two minutes of screen time, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> she definitely does more than the uh, Fire on the Mountain Girl did. Yes, I was going to say she's the, the first one since that Fire on the Mountain Girl, I think. Yes, um, and she does some cool action maneuvering and she's apparently the world's best scientist in the entire world besides her son chip chase dr harding here seems well aware that big robots are going to be after her plans because she she goes through this again she's super genius she goes through this very quickly super genius chip at chase here Uh (laughs) going going why would autobots be here they want the plans and then she tries to leave with the plans she is a genius Wow. so ratchet is skulking down the hallway here and blocks her path so what she does is, now, I, for some reason in my mind, she breaks through the window, but I believe she takes the well, time to open it. No, she breaks it. She, she does break the it. window. Okay. Yeah. Well, she doesn't break through it, which is how my mind went initially. So no, she, she, she didn't do a dramatic Rio. She breaks the window and jumps out onto an umbrella, a pe- like a, a parasol, a just an umbrella below. Like a beach size umbrella umbrella, which uh, still, mm, that should have skewered her. I, I was Honestly. going to say, I, I, I assumed it would be like another and just impales her. <laughs> I watched that too. We get a transition here. This is the, all right, this is the shortest transition of the episode. Where yeah, this is the one where I was like, okay. <laughs> Optimus and company just checking back in with them, still destroying planes. Let none stand against us. Ba-na-na-na. Oh, wow. That was mm, eight seconds. Just in case you were wondering, they're still up to no good over there. Bumblebee heads for the base now and the military men are still like, not another one. What the fuck? So Spike, like, leans out the window and he's like, listen, we're here to help. Sorry about whatever you've experienced so far. Bumblebee comes in and tries to help Optimus, but gets smacked, which gets Bumblebee all choked up here, Kristen. Kick the dog. Kick (laughs) the dog. How did this happen to my friend? He hit me right in the teeth. I'm so small. Don't you feel bad, Ugu? Transition number 10 here. (laughs) As we're at the satellite launch site, Kristen, and we have a man... 
saying that they need to abort the launch thanks to the fact that there's no there's no air and ground support is what they said. So uh-huh. we learn later Were that they expecting Megatron... resistance from other countries. <laughs> How dare the entire Earth get all this free energy? I'm going to send a jet up there out of spite, said guy who runs Russia, presumably. <laughs> so I was going to say, for some reason, Canada is just super mad at us. Free energy. Fuck that. Absolutely not. Megatron then literally walks through the wall here. <laughs> just just bursts Hi, it's through, me, I'm here. Burst through the wall. And he's like, no, the launch will take place. We uh, didn't go too much into detail, but when Ratchet is trying to t- chase uh, Dr. <laughs> to Chip Chase, Dr. Harding <laughs> earlier, um, he is in a human-sized hallway, like, all scrunched up. <laughs> so seeing Megatron enter a building, it's like, oh, this is why we usually don't see the Transformers inside anywhere. In human-sized buildings. I forgot to show you, Kristen, that is actually the episode screen grab that I grabbed as Ratchet all hunched over. Perfect. Going after Dr. Harding. No wonder he didn't catch her. So Megatron blows up the computers here and then orders Soundwave to reprogram the rest, which begs the question why he blew up computers in the first place. He just likes likes the explosions, Joe. It's fun. Nothing can stop the launch now. Um, and then we find out that they didn't get the plans, which I guess they were going to take those back to Cybertron and like replicate them to just have more power. I guess. So No, but then they were taking they were taking the satellite itself to Cybertron. They were taking the satellite and the rocket which can apparently just go to Cybertron unless they were planning on building more engines on it once they were launched, which begs the question, Kristen. They just had to take some ores out and row there. If human rockets can go to Cybertron, what are the Decepticons still doing here? They're looking for energy, Joe. I guess. So, whatever. Every once in a while, Shockwave is still like, yeah, things are still pretty bad here. <laughs> <laughs> so you probably don't want to come. Nothing has changed. I haven't fixed the energy crisis yet. Sorry about that. Was kind of hoping you would at this point. Yeah, it's taking a bit. We got transition number 11 here. <laughs> So Kristen, Sparkplug invented a personality reverser, which I eventually just started calling the attitude adjuster. (laughs) Okay, Joe. Yes. There will be time to talk about this. It could come up at any point, but I'm going to throw it out there now. Sure. There's a pretty obvious question that I have. Can you guess what it is? How do you flip the switch from good to evil? That is very close. My question is, if they have a thing that could turn people from evil to good. Oh my god. Why don't they just use it on the Decepticons? (laughs) Oh, for fuck's sake. I, there's so many, I, again, wasted potential. So many just, like, very convenient Saturday morning cartoon things in this episode. Invisibility spray could have been used a lot better. Turning the Autobots evil could have been used way better. Personality reverser. They have, like, a whole bushel of these things. They end up running out of them later, but it's clear that they can make a ton of them. Like, if you go back in time, rewrite this episode. Uh, maybe, accidentally... One of those things gets slapped on Thundercracker. I was not aware, Kristen, that these things were single-use as well. Like, they don't mention that they can only be used once until Hound starts firing them from his gun. Mm -hmm. So, like, uh, three-fourths of the way through this episode, that thought occurred to me, and I just couldn't really see anymore. I think I blacked out. Also, I'd like to think that if you hit Thundercracker with it, he stays exactly the same. (laughs) He's just maybe a little bit more accommodating. A well-meaning asshole instead of an asshole by design who wants to be more well-meaning, I guess. Can can you even imagine what good Starscream would be like? He would still be so annoying. I'm here to help. All they got to do to make this work is you need to touch someone with it as well. They're magnetic, and... which is a whole other fucking problem in and of itself. <laughs> because there's a lot of people just placing them onto their friends with their hands, which makes... No sense. No sense whatsoever, but whatever. Convenience, as the plot demands it. As... Also, like, it's a round thing. All of it is the opposite polarity. <laughs> of the... That's, like, not how magnets work. You got me, Kristen. They I got a no positive idea. and a negative side. It's really sad when someone who went to our school and forgot everything that they know about science completely is going like, wait a minute, that doesn't seem right. <laughs> All they got to do, Kristen, is test this on somebody, which... Conveniently, Blue Streak wakes up at this point, out for hours, my ass. I'm here. So yeah, they just pop that onto him. Uh, You can do it at any point on their body. The leg is a popular spot. (laughs) Oh yes, the the good and evil computer in the leg of all Transformers. Mm -hmm. Blue Streak gets fixed, and he knows all of the plans, but Sparkplug is more interested in turning the Autobots back to normal as... Isn't that the plan? 
Or I guess the plan is take energy to Cybertron. I guess Sparkplug is right that they got to turn the Autobots first so they don't have to murder them yeah. first to stop the plan. I so. have another stupid question, Joe. Yes. What is the problem with the Decepticons going back to Cybertron? <laughs> <laughs> then they would leave Earth alone. They're from Cybertron. Kristen, I think that Dr. Tanya Harding, Chip at Chase here, mm-hmm. is very convincing when she tells Optimus that the Earth needs her satellite, so... Then make another I... one. You have the blueprints. <laughs> Come on. Kristen, this was a government-funded program. It cost, in 80s dollars, $100 billion. Yeah, Joe, and it will make unlimited energy. <laughs> Sorry, we're going to be in a deficit for a while. Oops. But don't worry, with the unlimited energy, we're going to get that back pretty quickly. It'll be fine. I don't know, Kristen. That's, I mean, she's uh, the genius, so she must be right. Whatever. I guess there's the implication that if the Decepticons go back to Cybertron with this unlimited energy thing, they're going to fuck up the entirety of the planet. So the Autobots think it's better if the Decepticons stay on Earth, potentially endangering these lesser beings. Sure, well, Megatron also has multiple times said that he wants to rule the whole universe, so I don't yeah. know if he would go home and then just be like, and now I'm retiring. <laughs> just be like, I'm good with just our planet. Nice. I mean, I already owned this planet, but it's chill now. We transition back to Dr. Tanya Harding here, who is running away from Hound and Ratchet still. She hides in a dumpster, and so much of this dumpster-based shit, Kristen, is (sighs) so weird, because Hound comes over and he just crumples through it like aluminum foil, the first one. There There are two dumpsters, I should mention. They really just need the blueprints. But they also will be hard to read if they squish her all over them. I was I was going to say, if he, Hound gets blood all over the blueprints, I don't think they're going to be able to read them. No, unless um that fancy cartoon blueprint paper is waterproof, and I've just never known this whole time. Jazz arrives at this point before the second dumpster can be crushed, and Dr. Harding, while looking out here, is like, oh no, not another one. <laughs> like, for the second time in this episode, people are like, fuck Transformers, ugh. Yeah, Hound picks up that dumpster and then t- throws it at Jazz. It hits a wall and, like, explodes. And she just, like, combat <laughs> rolls out and starts running again. She's like, I'm good! I really should have double-checked whether or not she's wearing heels. In my mind, she is. In my mind, she is as well. Sparkplug manages to fix Hound right after this here, but Dr. Harding runs directly into Ratchet after Jazz is like, where's Ratchet? But hey, it's fine. He gets fixed, too. It really is uh, very dramatic for all of ten seconds. There is no extra information. Ratchet is just fixed as we get to transition 13. Nice. The military have parked a bunch of trucks in the way of the Autobots who are rampaging at the base here, but it does not do much to stop them. No, I mean, considering they've just been uh, picking up and crumpling metal with their bare hands this whole episode, not much of a defense. Bumblebee still keeps trying to use the power of friendship here as he jumps on top of a jet and goes... Optimus, if you're going to destroy these jets, you gotta destroy me too. And he's like, okay. And segment two ends with Optimus looming closer here as we see Bumblebee's horrified reflection on his window boobs. He's like, oh no, he, he is fine with that. And he was fine with that really fast. Segment three starts here, Kristen. There is a cargo plane and Skyfire. Sh- <laughs> Skyfire shows up here. as Well, Kristen, you gotta remember, Blue Streak mentioned that Megatron said to clear the skies as well, which I guess is why Skyfire is doing stuff. So these uh, poor men are just victims of circumstance. Yeah. And does one of the cargo plane people correctly identify Skyfire? Just like, look, it's Skyfire. That sounds right, but that might just be because I (laughs) want it to happen. And then Skyfire blows up the cargo plane. Not before both of the two drivers on this entire thing bail out. We don't know if there was anyone else on there. I don't remember seeing parachutes is all I'm saying. They did have parachutes. (laughs) Okay, good. Yes. The Autobots arrive and comment that Skyfire is bad guy, but we probably could have guessed that. Now, again, they're probably... Gotta reset it for the kids, I understand. But still, Mm -hmm. like, mm, either way. So we go through this whole, like, cerebral, four-dimensional chess discussion about, okay, how the heck are we gonna make Skyfire good again? Because with his help, we might have a chance against everyone else. By the way, where are the Dinobots? <laughs> Guys, do you think they're just like, <laughs> they're just crashing through like a China shop somewhere? <laughs> Dinobots in a China shop, of course. Yeah. I do have a, a list later of people that I specifically did not notice in this episode. Cool. So Kristen, as you mentioned, Sparkplug used a little bit of space age technology in uh, the attitude adjusters here. You put magnets in them. Wow. So Hound 
much like Megatron was able to put the exponential generator, the energy egg, the exponential <laughs> generator into his gun barrel and not blow it up when he fires, Hound is able to put the attitude adjuster into his gun, the particle beam whatever, which isn't even his weapon. Again, and... I say I don't mean to be pedantic, but that really means nothing at this point. Isn't the gun metal too? <laughs> he is able to fire the attitude adjuster at Skyfire. They pew 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 lure him closer with a laser attack. And he just gets attitude adjustment straight to his undercarriage. Dead on. And Skyfire lands with his only line of the episode. Thanks, I needed that. Cool. Goodbye. You're welcome. (laughs) They're just like, we need to go. It doesn't matter. Transition 14. We get back to Optimus and Bumblebee here. You won't do it, Optimus. I know you won't hurt me. It's now a weird time to mention with all of the um, evil Autobot dialogue that happens in this episode. I really feel like they just sound more Italian. Optimus picks Bumblebee up here and is about to slam dunk his goddamn head into the ground when all of the normal Autobots arrive here. (laughs) So now the uh, attitude gestures are just being popped into the gun and shot around. That's the easier way to do this. Single-use attitude adjusters here as Hound comes out guns blazing and manages to fix Prowl? (laughs) Yeah. Okay. And somebody else. (laughs) But Um, not Optimus. And we have a strange interlude here that lasts all of a minute where Optimus turns into a truck and then turns into three things. He's able to activate his trailer, which we have not seen the trailer gun properly yet. We might have seen it once. We, we saw that there was a weird combination that he launched once of Roller and the trailer gun that yeah. does not exist. But I don't remember if he activated the trailer gun to be used normally, unless in, like, the first episode, maybe. Am I crazy that in my brain, Roller looked a lot more like Rob the Robot? <laughs> well, he was gray here, which I don't that's, know if it was That's not a... really the mistake my brain is making. Well, Roller is just a six-wheeled... It looks like a Lunar Lander, basically. I feel like it had cute eyes. It looks like the thing that you ride on Space Mountain, basically. In my, in my brain, it's basically Wally. Not quite. Uh, it was also blue in the first episode. What a waste. But uh, attitude adjusters need to be used on both Optimus' trailer gun and Roller, but Optimus himself has not been completely changed, and they only got Kristen a little bit of just... Hey, we only got one left. Like, whoa, why, why did you make a limited number of them? Why? Um, yeah, I guess it's, they don't, they never say you can't just pull one off of someone else and reload them, but apparently you can't, whatever. They also, I guess there's the implication that by getting those two other components of Optimus changed nice again, that that helps Optimus. It's nothing Bumblebee is doing. I was going to say, I, do, I think that the episode is supposed to imply that Bumblebee's power of friendship did all of it, but... Uh, there, you Logically, could read it. it seems like no. You could read it as these two other pieces of Optimus have been changed, so Optimus is now not entirely evil, but it can come off either way, and I think David Wise probably wanted the power of friendship to win, but... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe he got beaten down a little bit, a little bit good, and then Bumblebee was like, okay, one more time, we're friends! <laughs> and then Optimus was like, you are right. And now, Kristen, I made the note... Teletran said that all of the Autobots were turned evil, but in this episode, we have not seen any of the five Dinobots. Mm-hmm. We have not seen Mirage. Mm-hmm. He, well, he was invisible. <laughs> did not see Asswipe. Did not see Sunstreaker. Didn't see Huffer Gears Windcharger. We saw Gears, right? We did see Trailbreaker, I remember. We saw Brawn. Brawn. That's, yeah. yep, I just got them messed up. Brawn and Gears, similar head. Understandable. Okay. Uh, completely different color scheme. Does not matter. <laughs> it's not going to make a difference at this point. <laughs> I do remember seeing Trailbreaker because his cool visor was all red, which I think is normally red. No, it's got to be blue. Yeah, I don't think so. Red the, t- the toy is the toy might be red. Whatever. Doesn't matter. Bumblebee once again springs into action here, saying that he will fix Optimus, and then Opt- <laughs> Optimus is struggling at this point. He's going uh, uh, as he breaks a jet over his knee in like one fell like bane breaking Batman's back. Just like <laughs> I really like this strange metal this genetically engineered metal (laughs) that just cracks like wood instead of bending (laughs) his knee is that powerful Kristen. Uh. so bumblebee runs up here Kristen, and instead of just attaching the device to optimus because he is small and fast he has to good guy speech him again yeah so one more time he's like let's do this again ah you could do it (laughs) i thought he was going to be like i don't even need this thing you can fight it on your own. 
Optimus just says, Bumblebee, do it. And then Bumblebee saunters over, not with no speed, just like, yep, mm, yeah, I knew I'd do it. And then just slaps it right on there. And Optimus is back to normal and he picks Bumblebee up like a child. Well, I just got a crazy idea. Does it seem like maybe the ending of this episode feels like two like divergent ideas that got put together where Optimus splitting into three parts means, oh no, we don't have anything to use on Optimus, only the power of friendship can fix him, versus, well, everyone else got changed the same way, so they just end the episode changing Optimus, too. Would you have liked it better if Optimus changed back due to the power of friendship? Um, I can't say that for sure. (laughs) I always tend to like my own ideas better in the moment, but if they came from somewhere else, I'm definitely biased to hate them. Fair enough. We get a transition here. It would make sense then that he split into three parts in the first place, which has absolutely no bearing on anything else. We join Jazz finishing, ex- literally, I love this, like the, just the, the mid-conversation, just ba na 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 and then Jazz goes, and that's Megatron's plan. Like, okay, thank you. We were spared well, all of that. Thanks, Mom. And Dr. Harding, again, just pleads her case to Optimus. The Earth needs this satellite. And Optimus, that's enough for Optimus. want to bet we're never going to hear about it ever again. Wow, Kristen, especially considering, unless <laughs> Optimus launched it wrong... <laughs> like it's not in the correct spot to collect energy and there's this just like one $100 billion albatross in the Earth's atmosphere. What we don't see is later Dr. Harding um, tries to call them to lodge a complaint and no one answers the phone. Everyone boards Skyfire here as they head for the launch pad. We get transition number 16 here. Still going. 30 seconds to launch, Kristen. And why have the Decepticons not boarded the fucking aircraft until literal seconds before launching? Because like Sonic the Hedgehog, they have a sense... Of tension and drama. Megatron also rips a panel off the side of a rocket, which is problematic for a rocket. <laughs> what? No. I believe we've lived through that, but... It's it's fine. So Skyfire arrives after the rocket has launched here. Optimus and Ratchet fucking base jump out of Skyfire to grab onto the top of the rocket as they go close to it. No problemo. Ratchet then pulls out a normal-ass spanner here, just like he had one in his forearm. He's like, oh, I got a wrench. Oh, man, I really wish someone's hand would just turn into a wrench. And this is all to take control of the rocket, as Optimus says, which, whatever. whatever. Um, That doesn't really make a ton of sense because later they just take the satellite off of it and they're like bye losers megatron and soundwave appear in the opening that megatron ripped off as they start firing lasers at the top of the rocket which Kristen is very safe of course yeah, extremely i mean i guess they don't really have that many other options luckily their aim is terrible the rest of the crew inside skyfire need a plan that hurts the decepticons but keeps optimus and ratchet safe as well as the satellite so <laughs> jazz is like oh <laughs> wait a minute up earlier <laughs> Time for that plotline to pay off. So he goes over, stands near one of uh, Skyfire's doors and is like, let me out. Um, (laughs) And Skyfire is like, okay, be careful. And then he drives on to Skyfire's snoot. Yes. And turns into, well, he army crawls down it, actually. And then he turns into a car. And then he starts blasting old time rock and roll. A musical sonic boom. Good old jazz, which... This apparently fucks up the fuel... makes it sound like he's done it before also. (laughs) Kristen, this fucks up the fuel tanks of the rocket. Yeah. Which sounds a little dangerous, and Megatron, knowing that this sounds dangerous, is just like, I gotta fucking leave. Let's get out of here. Do you think um, Spike and Sparkplug were, like, suddenly really, really happy that their brains weren't, like, shooken right out of their heads before because it seems like if it can explode metal so well and rocks so well human flesh probably like how do they survive at all kristen were spike and spark plugs still on skyfire as it goes into space as it flies into low orbit yeah i think so that was my uh, last and final problem with this episode Uh, i did not know i'm sorry i I saw you in space i was like "Mm." (laughs) <laughs> the Decepticons fly off, Optimus grabs onto the satellite, and they both- We just don't worry about wherever the rocket's going at this point. <laughs> <laughs> they, ju- they jump off the rocket, onto Skyfire, and Optimus orders Skyfire fly into orbit! Mm-hmm. And- Next stop, space! <laughs> and, and Optimus just goes, yeah! With the satellite, <laughs> and, it, and it all happens very quickly, and we, we transition away from it. Before you can even think about it. It's almost like the cartoon saying, I don't think that hurt about it. (laughs) Literally, 
before you can, you can, this is a literal blink and you miss it moment. Yep. For Optimus throwing the satellite into orbit. They might as well just end with the title card that said, and then it was fine, don't worry. <laughs> Back at the Ark. Ratchet has taken the Autobot fucker upper, because I forgot the name of it, out Whatever. of the energy beds here. The uh, piss bit. <laughs> The piss bit, of course. Like a fit bit, but piss. <laughs> Manufactured by Starscream immediately. Uh-huh, Starscream Enterprises. Optimus thanks Ratchet while giving Bumblebee a head pat here. It feels patronizing. <laughs> and then he thanks Bumblebee after already head patting him. I thought he was talking to Bumblebee when he was talking to Ratchet, but he was just treating Bumblebee like his little Persian cat while thinking out loud. Kristen Ratchet wants more credit for the plan here, even though he spent. of the episode evil. He did not come up with the attitude adjuster. He takes credit for firing it out of the gun, which was Hound's idea. Yeah, no, Ratchet's just a liar. (laughs) And he also says that he helped invent the attitude adjuster when Sparkplug did. But (laughs) And Sparkplug rightfully is like, what the fuck? This was mostly my idea. It's like, um, maybe the attitude adjusters messed up their brains a little bit. There can't be no side effects, right? (laughs) And Ratchet does drop the line here. You wouldn't know a microchip from a potato chip. <laughs> and Spark Plug's like, fucking whatever, I eat both. More arguments ensue until Jazz comes in and is just like, hey, so what about the 47 jets that we fucked up? <laughs> like, hey, props to them for even mentioning it. Um, even though Optimus probably uh, had the highest body count <laughs> out of everyone, <laughs> he's like, well... That's Ratchet and Sparkplug's problem. Yeah, he pawns it off on them, even though he was the one who fucked up the most jets. And where's Wheeljack as well? Because he's the fucking tech wizard of these people. I miss my best friend, my Italian cousin, Wheeljack. Spike comments they'll be fixing jets for a few weeks here. And the episode ends with Sparkplug laughing. And that's, that's it. Like, haha, I love jets. I was almost worried that the end of the episode was going to be um, just everyone overlapping, arguing about why they were the integral part of the plan. So I'm like, whatever. It's all in good fun. Kristen, that was Attack of the Autobots. And I I believe that we're never going to see, one, the invisibility spray, Mm -hmm. two, Dr. Harding's energy satellite. Weird, because that seems like kind of an important thing. Three, the attitude adjuster or the personality destabilizer, either version of them. Mm -hmm. Because, again, can't turn Autobots or Decepticons good slash evil because we already did that plot, I guess. It's not as if you could do something interesting with that multiple ways. (laughs) Again, that's the thing. There's plot elements that could be interesting that aren't in this episode. Like, every single one of them is just half-baked. And that is why David Wise only gets half a point for the episode. It definitely could have been worse. I'm really not sure what to think about season two so far. Kristen, I think with Culture Clash as the low bar, no matter what David David Wise is going to get a half mark, we started with, hopefully, Kristen, if there is any episode of Transformers worse than Culture Clash, <laughs> I'm going to be very mad. I mean, yeah, we gotta keep an eye out for that Paul Dini. Who knows? He could sweep it and give us a magic episode. <laughs> oh my god, magic Transformers. No, thank you. Now's the point in the evening where we'll list off all of the fun contact things or where you can find us. You can follow us on the Twitter machine at C-A-W-T-A pod. You can follow me at Octopus, which is A-W-K-T-A-P-U-S. You can follow me at Marina Kazam, Marina underscore K-A-Z-A-M. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, on the SoundCloud, on the Stitcher Radio, on the YouTube even. Leave a rating, give a review, do whatever you feel like. You can also drop us a line, cwtapod at gmail.com, where you can tell us all about the practical use of invisibility spray. And Kristen, if you ever, man, you ever wake up feeling like somebody flipped your switch from good to evil. Every day of my goddamn life. And check out my solo podcast side project, ASMR Relationships, the podcast equivalent of listening to gossip that has nothing to do with you. You can find a link to it in the episode notes. Follow it on Twitter at Reddit Gossip. Go ahead and give that a listen. Next time, Kristen, will be Traitor. <laughs> One of the episodes that I watched when I was looking ahead all those months ago, and I think you'll be pleased to learn, Kristen, that this is a Mirage-centric episode. You know what? That's different. I love it. If it's not about Kimber, I'm happy. <laughs> Well, it's also about Cliff Jumper, so... Ugh, I'm less happy about that. For the Can We Talk About podcast, my name is Joe. I am Kristen. And join us next time when there will be a traitor in our midst. <laughs> Return to sender. Checks in the mail. <laughs>